Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to the Rabbi Alan Mervis lecture of the Strauss Center for Torah and Western Thought of Yeshiva University. I want to thank uh, Ted and Ruth and the entire Mervis family uh, for making this lecture possible and allowing us the extraordinary experience that is this lecture today. I want to thank Sherith Israel and its leadership uh, for offering us their, sanct their magnificent sanctuary and for co-sponsoring the event. I want to welcome uh, Rabbi Roth and Chazan Malavani uh, of the uh, Fifth Avenue Synagogue. I want to take note, uh, before we begin, of two other uh, ongoing Strauss Center efforts. The first is an event that we'll be holding uh, Wednesday, April 13th at the Yeshiva University Museum in partnership with other parts of Yeshiva University, the image of the Haggadah, focusing on the art and aesthetic of Haggadot. And flyers with information are available outside. And also available outside is our newest book, of which we're extremely proud, Torah and Western Thought, Intellectual Portraits of Orthodoxy and Modernity, which is uh, provide intellectual biographies of great rabbinic leaders of the, and Torah teachers of the 20th century. It may not be a New York Times bestseller, but I am very proud to announce that it is a YU Svarim sale bestseller. Uh, and uh, we even apparently, I thought we did not, but we even ended up outselling Kosher by Design, uh, which was huge. Uh, and the only book that outsold uh, this volume uh, was some new chumash uh, that was put out with a commentary from somebody named Joseph Soloveitchik. Uh, we haven't figured out who that is, but as soon as we do, uh, we're going to work on uh, outselling him uh, as well. It is the very subject of rabbinic leadership uh, that brings us here today. Uh, we know, as uh, emblazoned in our mind as the ultimate image of the rabbi, is the man that we today call Moshe Rabbeinu. And we celebrate his career first and foremost as a teacher of Torah and one who actually interacted with the divine and served as a conduit between God and Klal Yisrael, allowing us to act to access the infinite mind of the Almighty. And of course, he was that. And of course, it is the job of every rabbi to serve in this capacity. But we know from Moshe Rabbeinu's biography that on his way to becoming the Rabbeinu that he ultimately became. His career began with the extraordinary and small sentence in the Torah, Vayigdal Moshe Vayetze El Achav, that when Moshe literally grew, as he became, as it were, a gadol, he went out unto his brethren. And what this marks for us is that an essential aspect of rabbinic leadership is being among one's brethren. And that is an aspect of rabbinic leadership that is all too often missed today. And it is to celebrate this aspect of the rabbinate that the Rabbi Alan Mervis lecture was founded, celebrating and commemorating the life of a shul rabbi living in Hampton, Virginia, who was his congregants one and only connection to Judaism, to their faith, to their history, and to the God of Klal Yisrael. And we're so honored to welcome Rabbi Alan Mervis's cousin, Chief Rabbi of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth, Ephraim Mervis, to memorialize his cousin by delivering the Rabbi Alan Mervis lecture this morning. I now call upon Dr. David Mervis to speak about his father and to introduce the Chief Rabbi. Thank you. Good morning. My name is David Mervis. I'm the other Mervis, Ted's brother. It is really a unique honor for me to be able to introduce not one, but two Rabbis Mervis this morning. The first, of course, is Rabbi Ephraim Mervis, the chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth, who will address us shortly. His talk, as Rabbi Soloveitchik mentioned, is in memory of the second Rabbi Mervis, Rabbi Alan Mervis, our father. I also have to mention a third Rabbi Mervis, Rabbi Lionel Mervis. 
Rabbi, Rabbi Ephraim Mervis's father. Actually, Lionel Mervis's father first made contact with our father. Uh, we always knew as children that we had relatives in South Africa, but had no contact at all. And it was Lionel's father who first made contact. Lionel then con continued the connection uh, between our two parts of the family. And Rabbi Lionel Mervis celebrated his 90th birthday last Friday, Mazel Tov. Rabbi Alan Mervis served as rabbi of congregation B'nai Israel in Hampton for 32 years. And this Hampton, as Rabbi Soloveitchik mentioned, was in Virginia and not on Long Island. Hampton had a small Jewish community and our shul was the only one in town. Thus, our father was also a chief rabbi of Hampton. Few members of our shul were observant, but participating in a synagogue was very important to them. The shul and its rabbi were virtually the only connection that the community had with Judaism. The role of the rabbi in this and other communities like it was very complex. Our father served not only in the classical role of religious leader, but as the chazan, a shochet, a marriage counselor, the youth director, the adult education director, the religious school principal and teacher, the executive director, and at times, the maintenance crew. As a warm-up to Rabbi Ephraim Mervis's talk on the role of the rabbi in the 21st century, I'd like to share with you some of the thoughts of our father on the role of the rabbi in the last century and in his own words. In a sermon he delivered on June 18th, 1943, at age 25, he said, quote, one year ago has already elapsed since coming to Hampton. Yes, exactly one year ago tonight, I delivered my first sermon to you. You may be able to imagine what are the thoughts and emotions that come to me at this time? I cannot describe them to you, but you might be able to guess what some of them are as we talk together about what are the functions of a rabbi and his place in the Jewish community, and what are the functions of a rabbi in relation to his people and his people to him. In doing so, your rabbi is exposing his very heart and he hopes thereby to reach yours in turn. He continued to differentiate between the roles of priest and king as practiced by Avraham and Moshe. Quote, if a rabbi in Israel possesses in a small way something of the place among his people, which these men, Avraham and Moshe held, then clearly must he manifest those traits which belong predominantly to the priest and at other times, those traits which are characteristic of the king. In his home life and in his intimate relation to his people, he may be expected to exhibit his priestly qualities. He must be a friend to all men. He must unswervingly pursue the path of justice. His heart must be full of compassion and loving kindness. But when wrong raises its ugly head in the life of an individual or in the life of a community, he must exhibit righteous indignation and stern immovability. When a moral issue is at stake, when an interpretation is involved of our fundamental beliefs and practices, then he must well know that the king by justice established the land and his people must so understand and interpret his behavior. These were our father's comments about the role of the rabbi in the 20th century. Rabbi Ephraim Mervis will take us into the future. Rabbi Ephraim Mervis was born in South Africa and studied and received Samicha Yeshiva's Karen Biavne, Haaretz and Machon Ariel in Israel. He served as chief rabbi of Ireland and as rabbi of major synagogues in London. And according to his bio on Wikipedia, he is a devoted fan of Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. More, more applause. On September 1st, 2013, he was inducted as Chief Rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the British Commonwealth. In his address at his induction ceremony, he provided a perfect segue between his talk on the role of rabbi in the 21st century 
and the thoughts of our father on the role of a rabbi in the 1940s. He said, quote, every generation faces its own challenges and every generation must provide the response to the challenges it faces. With our minds turned to the past and our eyes firmly fixed on the future, rooted in our tradition and in touch with the world around us, governed by halacha, we must find the necessary tools to transform our challenges into opportunities as we hold on ever so tightly to our spiritual legacy, which passes through our hands en route to the generations to come. During his first three years of his chief rabbinate, Rabbi Mervis has demonstrated his ability to meet these challenges. He has made difficult and at times contentious decisions on issues including his only examples intra-faith collaboration among branches of Judaism, interfaith relationships, and women's issues in orthodoxy. At Rabbi Mervis' induction ceremony, the outgoing chief rabbi, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, concluded his address by noting that Rabbi Mervis' initials are now C-R-E-M, Chief Rabbi Ephraim Mervis, and concluded, quote, he is assuredly creme de la creme. And finally, I will welcome my cousin, Rabbi Mervis. Rob Soloveitchik, Ted and Ruthie, David and Linny, and members of the Mervis family, members of the Strauss Center faculty, Rabbanim Nichbadim, ladies and gentlemen. Valerie and I are so delighted to be here today for this significant event. And I consider it an enormous privilege that I was invited to deliver the Rabbi Alan Mervis lecture this year. Together with us from the UK, we have our son Noam, and also from the UK, my sister Lynette and brother-in-law, Rabbi Vivian Silverman. Indeed, as David mentioned, as part of the South African branch of the Mervis family, we were enormously excited when the discovery was made that we had real relatives in America, close relatives. And when we actually started to meet one another, we in South Africa became great fans of our American cousins. As David mentioned, my father, Rabbi Dr. Lionel Mervis, celebrated his 90th birthday two days ago, and he developed a close relationship with his cousin, Rabbi Alan Mervis, and despite being geographically detached from each other through correspondence and the odd meeting, they developed a very close and meaningful bond. In uncanny fashion, they looked alike, they spoke in a similar way, <laughs> they had similar rabbinic careers. It's something just quite remarkable. And we're so pleased that now, down further generations, the relationship continues. And I was so enormously touched and moved when uh, David and Linny and Ted and Ruthie came over for that memorable day on the 1st of September 2013 when I was installed into office as Chief Rabbi. It is therefore in this context such an enormous honor for me through this lecture to pay tribute to a truly outstanding spiritual leader, Rabbi Alan Mervis, Zichron Olivracha. The Mishnai Masechet Sota, Perik Tet, Mishnah Tet Vav, describes the situation with regard to Be'ikvot Meshicha, when the footsteps of the Messiah can be seen, an era within which it is obvious that great things are about to happen. Simanim, signs are given. And one of the simanim is Penei Hadar Kifnei Hakelev. The appearance of that generation will be the appearance of a dog. What is meant by this cryptic teaching? The Kotzka Rebbe explains that the term Panay does not only mean appearance, 
It also means the leadership. And therefore, Penei Hador, the leadership of that generation, Kifnei HaKelev, will have the appearance of a dog and explain the Kotzke Rebbe. When a shepherd goes out to tend his flock, he takes with him a sheepdog. The role of the shepherd is to look after those sheep who are keen to graze, who want to drink, who will loyally stay together within the flock, together with their shepherd. The role of the sheepdog, however, is to stand on the periphery, to guarantee that all the sheep stay within the flock, and if a little shepsela starts to stray, then the sheepdog will run after it and try its best to bring it back. So the Kotzka Rebbe said, historically, the prime role of a rabbi has been the ro'e ne'eman la'adato, the faithful shepherd to his flock. Rabbis within our rich and wonderful Jewish history have primarily concerned themselves with those who are devoted, those who are loyal, those who are thirsting for spiritual motivation, those who are hungry to partake of the Torah delights which are so bountiful. But, said the Kotzke, the time will come when there will be a need for a new type of Jewish spiritual leader in the mold of the sheepdog, whose primary role will be to keep everyone within the fold. While the shepherd's dream is to create Russia Yeshiva, the sheep's dog's dream will be to ensure that Jewish people will have Jewish grandchildren. And indeed, in our time, we have seen that the sheepdog style of rabbi has come into existence within outreach movements through care of opportunities being grasped through Baalei, Tshuva, Yeshivot, and seminaries, we have a type of spiritual leader which exists primarily, if not exclusively, to guarantee that we stay within the fold. But I genuinely believe that the pulpit rabbi actually exists in our time to serve both roles. The outstanding pulpit rabbi of the 21st century must be a fusion of shepherd and sheepdog. Somebody who is there for those who are loyal, those who are dedicated, those who are learned, those who are from, and somebody who is equally there for those whom he doesn't see. But somehow or other, they happen to be there, and he reaches out to them, and he tries to bring them back into the fold. We need not leave it to care of organizations which are outstanding, to deal with the whole area of maintaining the Yiddishkeit of Jews around the world. The most successful people are those who within established shuls are able to delight both those who are dedicated and to bring in those who are not yet committed. The Gemara in Masechet Megillah brings us a brighter. Tanya Amar Rabbi Yossi. Rabbi Yossi taught. Kol yamai ha'yiti mitzta'er al mikrazeh. Throughout my life I was troubled by one pasuk. What an amazing statement. <laughs> he was troubled by only one pasuk. He couldn't work out the meaning of it. Must have been a very difficult pasuk. And he quotes the pasuk. It's in Tvarim Perik Kavchet. It's in the Tochacha of Parshat Kitavo. And it reads, Vahayita Mamashesh Batsaurim, Kashe Yamashesh Hayiver Bafela. In deeply desperate times, you will grope around in the middle of the day in the same way as a blind man gropes around in the middle of the night. Amar Sarabiyosi asked and he said, Vichima Echbet Leila Iver Benafela Leora. What difference does it make to the blind person, whether it is day or night? We're told this is a curse. You will grope around at noon in the way that a blind man gropes around in the middle of the night. But Nebuch, for a blind person, it's nighttime, 24 hours a day. 
So Rabbi Yossi said, something once happened. And through this occurrence, I worked it out. Once I was walking home, and it was in the middle of the night, it was absolutely dark. And I saw a blind person coming towards me, and he had a lantern in his hand. And I saw this lantern growing larger and larger. And when he came and he stood in front of me, I realized there was this blind person walking along holding the lantern. Amartilo, I said to him, Beni, my son, avukazo lamalach. Why do you need this lantern? What's going on here? Amar Lisa, he replied to me and he said, Kozman she'avuka beyadi, this lantern is not for my sake, for me to see. Because as long as the lantern is in my hands, b'nei adam ro'im oti, u'metzilin oti, min apchatin, min akotzin, min abarkanim. This is for other people to notice that I am here. And if they see that I am here, they can help me not to walk on thorns, not to fall into pits, not to trip over branches. So therefore, Rabbi Yossi understood that the tochecha here is for a time, chas v'shalom, when there will be Jewish people who will be so lost that they'll be walking around in the middle of the day like a blind man walks around in the middle of the night without a lantern in his hand. He will be lost and he won't be able to be seen. And nobody will be knowing that he's there and as a result there'll be no hope for him. There are so many Jewish people who are lost. They're holding a lantern in their hand. Whether they know it or not, they're calling out to us, notice us, try and help us. Please prevent us from assimilating. In the UK, we now have a census every 10 years. It's on the year ending with a one. So we had one in 2001. The most recent was in 2011. For the census in 2001, for the very first time, there was a new category of question, faith. The respondents were invited to mention their faith. A long list of options. And you could ignore it if you wanted to. Valuable information for us. Baruch Hashem, over 10 years, until 2011, the last census that was held, the Jewish population of Great Britain grew. An amazing phenomenon. And we therefore now have figures relating to those who are proud enough to declare we are Jewish. Now we know how many people are members of our shuls across the denominations, who are members of our sports centers and cultural centers. And there is a gap between the figures we have for people who are formal members of anything that's Jewish and those who have recognized their Judaism by ticking a box on the census form. And we have calculated that 27% of those who tick the box Jewish do not belong to anything at all, nothing whatsoever. And for me, they are as important as the people that I see in Shul, Shachrit Mincha and Mayrev, every single day. The fact that they're declaring that they're Jewish means avukah biyadam, they're holding a lantern in their hand. And we need to find an entry point for them. Sometimes the entry point can be because they're standing on security duty, not inside our shuls, but outside it. Sometimes it's through a connection with Medinat Yisrael. Sometimes it's a connection through anti-Semitism and the visiting of Holocaust centers and sites. Sometimes it's through Jewish sports clubs, Maccabi activities. Whatever it is, there are entry points and we need to create additional entry points to respond to the fact that they're holding out that lantern, they're declaring we're Jewish, in order that we can encourage them to engage with their roots and to become more meaningfully Jewish through the membership of a Jewish organization so that they can play their role to guarantee that 10 or 20 or 30 years later, members of their family will still tick that box that they are Jewish. At the Seder table, we will recite the words, Keneget Arba'a Banim Dibra Torah. The Torah addresses itself to 
four types of Jewish children, and the correct translation of Arba Banim is not four sons, it's four children. When the Torah says, Banim atem l'ashem elokechem, you are children unto the Lord your God, we recognize that word Ben sometimes is a son and sometimes it's a child. So I must tell you, all the translations of Arba Banim, the four sons, and all those caricatures and diagrams in all of your Haggadahs, they are wrong. They are not four sons, they are four children. Why should we disenfranchise 50% of our people from being part of the Torah that addresses itself to Am Yisrael? The Torah speaks to four types of Jewish children. Echad chacham, ve'echad rasha, ve'echad tam, ve'echad she'ino yodea lisho. One who is wise, one who is bad, one who is simple and one who doesn't ask. And my question is, why all the echads? Echad chacham, vechad rasha, vechad. Let it say, chacham rasha, tam v'sheno yodeh alisha. And there can only be one answer, because our tradition insists that the chacham equals echad, the wise child, the loyal child, the good child, is equal to 100% of a person, of a child, in our eyes. He equals one. The rasha is also equal to echad, echad rasha. The child who disappoints us, the child who worries us, the child who turns his or her back on their Jewish past, they're also precious in our eyes. They're also one. The Tam who perhaps might intellectually not be as bright as we had hoped for, that child is also Echad. And the one who is so distanced from Yiddishkeit that he or she doesn't even know what to ask because of their ignorance, they too equal Echad. Every single Jewish person is precious in our eyes. And if one is going to be a Jewish spiritual leader, that is the most basic principle upon which to work and to operate. What's the response to the She'eno Yodea Lisho? At Petachlo. Give him or her the opening. But the grammar is wrong. It should be At Petachlo. Or ata petachlo. At is feminine, petach is masculine. So some of our mafarshim say, well, from here we learn that it's the role of both father and mother to educate. Shema beni musar avicha, va'alti tosh torati mecha, as the Pasuk says. Listen, my child, to the tradition of your father and do not forsake the Torah of your mother. But I saw a lovely parish in the parish Baruch She'amar ala Gada, and he says as follows. It can't be at betachlo, you must provide the opening for him, because it doesn't make grammatical sense. The word he says is not at meaning you, it's aleph taf. From aleph to taf, betachlo. Give him or her everything, from A to Z, aleph to taf. Don't presume that because the person is unknown to us or because they're ignorant or because they haven't learned for so many years, so we can give a half-hearted approach to such yidden. On the contrary, every Akiva can become a true Rabbi Akiva. At Petachlo. We need to give the Sheinoyo de Alishol as much attention and importance as we provide for the Chacham in our midst. Notice that the way in which we define our children is according to what they say, how they communicate. Chacham mahu omer. What does the Chacham say? Rasha mahu omer, tam mahu omer. And the Sheinoi Yodei Elishol, who lo omer, he doesn't say anything. And he's defined by somebody who doesn't even ask. We test who the real person is according to what that person says, how that person communicates, and if that's the case with regard to everyone within Klal Israel, how much more so is it the case with regard to our Rabbanim? We test our Rabbanim. We determine how well they are performing according to their skills of communication. You go to shul, and the question is when you come home, Ma hu omer, what did he say? How well did he say it? And how long did he take to say it? <clears throat> so if that is the case, let's look at the art of communication as it is presented to us in Chumash. And you will find that there are six key terms used for how we communicate, each one of critical importance to the Rav. 
The first two are the best known to us, Dibur and Amira, speaking and saying. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, time and time again, says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Daberu b'nei Yisrael ve'amarta elehem. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them. So what's the difference between Dibur and Amira? Speaking and saying. Chazal tell us that Dibur is the formal speech. Indeed, Dalet, Bet, Resh, they're harsh letters. There is gravity, strength associated with Dibur. That's the authoritative statement of the leader, to be Medaber, to Paskan Halacha, to give direction, to deliver that address, to be the authority. Amira is something very different. It's conversation. To be Omer means, and indeed it has a soft touch to it, Aleph Memresh, it means have a chat. So therefore, Hashem is saying to Moshe Rabbeinu, Daber Rabbeinu Yisra v'amartai lehem, if you're going to be a successful Rav, first of all, you have to be good at the Dibur, the formal authoritative pronouncement, and you also have to have the art of Amira. How to have a conversation with people, how are things going, how, bus how is business? Look at the kind of a weather we're having this morning. Four seasons in one morning, isn't it amazing? That's what everybody's talking about. So the Rav should chat about that as well, politics and sport. He needs to be a man of the people, Dibur and Amira. And that's the way HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself addressed Moshe. Vayadaber Hashem el Moshe leimor, Dibur and Amira from Hashem. And Moshe was asked to emulate that. And so too through the ages. To be like Moshe Rabbeinu, to be an outstanding Rav, you need to be a man of the people, and at the same time, a halachic authority a spiritual leader of gravitas in their midst. The third term is tzivoy, to command. There was a time when within our midst we had a lot of that. People were guided through force, through emphasis, through commands, through instructions. In the 21st century, I do not recommend that. Instead, one should lead, wherever possible, through influence with ahava and not yira. Bring people to follow what you're saying, not because they fear the repercussions if they refuse, but because they love the connotation of what you're talking about. Bring them there because they realize that if they don't come, they'll be seriously missing out on something. Influence them, guide them. And indeed, we find that in the very last mitzvah presented in the Torah, mitzvah tariag, Mitzvah number 613, what is it? It's a mitzvah to write to Sefer Torah. It's called the Shira. The Torah is all about song, it's melody. Leading a Torah true way of life provides one with happiness and joy. Sima b'fihem, says the Torah, place the Torah in their mouths. That's the role of the Mechanech, of the Rav, the teacher, the spiritual leader. And Rav Dezle in his Sefer, Michtav Meliahu asks, surely the Torah should have told us, place it in their hearts, place it in their, mouth, in their minds, but why Sima B'fihem, place Torah in their mouths? And Rav Dezle answers by saying, the example here is from the way in which one feeds a child. So if you have an infant and you've got a problem, the kid is, you know, dovka, doesn't want to eat. So you play a little game. You put the food in a spoon and you make it into a helicopter and you go zoom, zoom, zoom all around. And eventually come close to the kid's mouth. He'll open his mouth and you put it inside. That's as far as you can go. Sima b'fihem. If after that you try to push the food down his throat, he's going to reject it. And so too with Torah. Our aim is to make it appealing and palatable. But we need to leave it up to people to digest Torah. We should never push it down their throats, never try to force a Torah true way of life upon people because then there'll be a danger that they will reject it. So tzivoy, to command, is something which sometimes is necessary, but it should be used sparingly. The fourth term is lahodia, to make known. Lahodia livnei adam as far as HaKadosh Baruch Hu is concerned. And to be modia means 
to pass information from one person to another. But to be more dear does not necessarily involve any emotional experience through the passing over of that information. Merely it could be from the notebook of the lecturer to the notebook of the student. That is more dear. But the last two terms, I believe, are the most significant in general and truly the most significant as far as the Rav is concerned. The last two terms for communication are le saper and le hagid. And both of them are the very essence of the Pesach Seder experience. Le saper, sipuri etziat mitzrayim, to relate the story, to tell the story. The word in Hebrew for story, sipur, comes from the term sapir, sapphire stone. The sapir, sapir was on the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol in the temple. Sapphire sparkles, it dazzles, and so too. The story takes drab facts and it makes them sparkle in your eyes. It brings something alive. And it's also important how long the story is. And that is why lispor, to count, comes from the same root. We need to count our words to convey that information in a responsible way. And I'd like to suggest that perhaps this is the same reason why from the same root of Samach Peresh, we have sapar or saparit, a barber or a hairdresser. What have they got to do with the story and uh, with counting? You know, in English, you've got counting and recounting. It's the same thing. You see, as far as the barber's concerned, he needs to have it according to the right length. That's the test of how good the barber is. Style is important, but most important of all is length. And so too with regard to the sipur. There are different styles of telling the story, but length is crucially important. So we need to engage in sipur. We need to excite people. We need to make our Yiddishkeit relevant. Today we are competing with the most sophisticated methods that are available to impart communication more than at any other time in the history of this world. And we therefore need to use the most sophisticated methods to impart our Yiddishkeit, to make it sparkle. And finally, lahagid. Lahagid, to tell. It comes from the root neged, which means to face. The nagid is the leader. Because the Nagid faces the people, Neget Ha'am, in order to demonstrate to them how to do something. Ultimately, a great leader is not only somebody who teaches in a formal capacity, but who by example sets the tone for others because they see how he conducts his life. That is the true Nagid the one engaged in Magid, and that's exactly what we do at our Seder table. That's what Magid, the essence, the most important, crucial part of Seder proceedings is. Where the leader of the Seder demonstrates in an audiovisual fashion, through what he raises, through what he talks about, through what people taste, and through what people do, this is how you do it, follow my lead. So therefore, when it comes to being an outstanding Rav in our time, we need Rabbanim who are able to be Mibetaber, to give the great sermon, to be the authority, who can engage in Amirah, who are true people of the people, who are interested in other people and engage with them and their lives in every possible way, to use the tzivoy sparingly, to encourage people through love, to embrace the life of Torah and mitzvot, to impart information, to be masaper, to enable our tradition to sparkle, to dazzle the mind, and to demonstrate by example. And through speaking about the role of the Rav, the rabbi of the 21st century, we must include the Rabbanit, the Rebetzin, the rabbi's wife, a most crucial partner in everything that he does. Perhaps, as I recommend, the Rabbanit has a profession of her own, her own life, her own way of fulfilling herself, but she and the Rav will always be a dynamic team setting an example for all, the ultimate nigidim, those who face others and show this is how it can be done. Now to achieve these methods of communication, to get through to people, to inspire them, and to hopefully make an impact on their lives, I believe that there are three components of the life of the Rav which are crucially important. 
They are, first of all, empathy, then sincerity, and then inclusivity. And let's look at each one in turn. Empathy. Every year, on Pesach morning, after the Seder, when I come into shul and I say, good John to Vachag Sameach, I then notice the first two questions that everybody asks. So what are the first questions you are asked? Number one, how is your Seder? Number two, at what time did it end? <laughs> That's it, around the world, same two questions. And I think that there is a perception out there that the later your Seder ends, the more from you are. <laughs> Maybe it's correct, but I want to tell you that sometimes it's actually totally incorrect. There's a fascinating debate in the mission of Asechet Psachim between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel with regard to Hallel. This is the only occasion in which we split the Hallel in two. According to Beit Shammai, we say the first paragraph of Hallel, Hallelujah, and then we eat. According to Beit Hillel, it's the first two paragraphs, Hallelujah and Betzet Yisrael, and then we eat. Abar Banel in his parish says something very beautiful. Notice that Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel agree on this unusual phenomenon of breaking Hallel in two, because both Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel agree that there are children around the table and they're hungry and we shouldn't delay the meal. You've finished Maggid, you want to go into Hallel? Start it. The rest can wait until after the meal. And if we're honest, there are many adults around the table who, like the children, are very hungry. So Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel excelled in empathy because if you want to get through to people, you have to place yourself in their shoes. You have to understand them. Don't ruin our prime educational experience of the year through forcing it to drag on for too long. Now, why is it that Beit Hillel here seems to be machmir? Beit Shammai said just one paragraph. Beit Hillel said, no, we insist on two paragraphs. What is the second paragraph? But say to Israel, it's all about the Exodus. It's central to the theme of Magid. If you're going to stop Hallel short, you have to include that in the proceedings at that point. As a result, therefore, I want to reassure you. If you finish your Seder, let's say at 11 p.m., midnight, it is quite possible that you have had one of the most outstanding Sidorim you can achieve. It all depends on who is around the table, what is their temperament, their level of patience, are they into long divrei Torah? Are they not? How do we optimize this experience? It's all about empathy. And if you want to teach, if you want to be that Magid to engage others in the process of Magid, then you need to know who you are addressing to understand one and all in a genuine way. Secondly, sincerity. A Rav to be successful must be 100% sincere and genuine. Earlier, I gave you the parish of the Kotzke Rebbe to that mission in Masechet Sota, Penei Hador Kifnei HaKelev. Let me now share with you the parish of Rabbi Yisrael Salanta on the same mission. Said Rabbi Yisrael Salanta, sometimes a man or a woman will take a dog for a walk. And... Uh, you'll notice that the dog is running ahead of the owner, perhaps on a lead, even perhaps not on the lead. Now, somebody who's witnessing this from across the road will say, wow, who's the leader? It's the dog. The person is following the dog. Suddenly, the person, the owner, turns the corner. The dog will look, oh, they've turned the corner. The dog will run from behind and now run in front again in the new direction. Said Rabbi Srol Salanta, the world is going to reach the depths of despair. And that'll be a sign that the Mashiach is on his way. And when will that be? When world leaders are like the dog. When they are leading others, but in actual fact, the leaders are the followers. Leaders who fashion their policies and their approach based exclusively on what they think people want them to be saying and what people want them to be doing. They're not people of integrity, not leaders of conviction. 
Instead, said Rabbi Yisrael, a true and great leader is somebody who declares, Acharai, after me. I believe that this is what I should be doing. I believe that this is what we all should be doing. Take a leaf out of my book. Perhaps I won't be so popular, but this is right. And I won't break my principles, even if it might mean that I could lose the odd election. That is a true leader. In our benching, we quote the Pasuk. Let us find grace and favor in the eyes of God and people in that order. That's how the Rav should be. That's how we should all be. When it comes to popularity, the most important thing of all is that our Kodesh Baruch Hu could, should like us and what we're doing. And after that, Adam. Ultimately, a Rav must be able to look at himself in the mirror every night before he goes to sleep and to say, every decision I made, every policy I adopted, every statement I gave, it was the right thing. And when you know that what you've done has been right, even though it might have been controversial, even though you might have lost support from this side or that side, you'll be able to live with yourself and you'll be proud of what you are about. And that's what we need, conviction leadership. People who fashion their outlook according to what they believe is truly correct. At the end of Megillat Esther, which we read just two weeks ago, the concluding pasuk includes five accolades to Mordechai Hayudi, one of which was Viratsui Lerov Echav. He was found to be favorable in the minds of the majority of his brethren. That's a great compliment. Most people liked him. That's the best that a great leader can hope for. Because Rabbi Sroll Salanta said, if you're a leader and everybody loves you, you're not a leader. And if you're a leader and nobody loves you, you're not a match. Ultimately, if you're going to properly lead here and there, you're going to disappoint people. Not that you want to disappoint, not that you like disappointing. But how can you issue a proper psakalacha? How can you adjudicate between two parties? How can you be true and loyal to Torah tradition when people are trying to drag you in this direction and in that? Ultimately, Hopefully, most people will like what you say. And even those who don't like what you say, hopefully they will respect your sincerity because they know that you're trying to do what is true and correct. Finally, in addition to empathy and sincerity, a great Rav must strive to achieve inclusivity. Yesterday in Shul, we read in Parshat Shmini, a list of the birds which, according to Torah law, are treif. When it comes to animals, we have two simanim, fish, two simanim. But with regard to birds, we're given the list of those which we cannot eat. And one of the birds on the list is called Hachasida, the stork. Isn't that an incredible name? The Hasida, the one which engages in chesed, the kind-hearted creature. What a wonderful term to be used. But then why is it treif? What's wrong with a chassidah who engages in chesed? The Chidush Harim, the founder of Gera Chassidus, explained as follows. He said, we know that from the Ramban, all those birds on that list of treif birds, they're birds of prey. They have a natural, cruel streak. The chassidah, he says, is kind-hearted to birds of its own feather, but towards other birds and creatures, it acts with cruelty and disdain. Therefore, within its own circle, it's kind-hearted. It's a chassidah. It engages with chesed. It's very kosher. But outside of its circle, it's treif. And that's why we don't eat the chassidah. And what a strong and profound message that is for us all. Don't we see in so many circles people who are totally committed to their own closed circle, their own grouping, their own type, their own group. And with regard to others, they outwardly and proudly reject them and act towards them with disdain. We find it within the Jewish world. We find it between the Jewish world and outside of the Jewish world. Perhaps there's a lot of chesed there, but that way of life is treif. It's not a kosher form of existence. The true Rav is one who promotes Ahavat Yisrael, who's a champion of genuine, natural love between all Jews, and is also somebody who's a champion of natural affection 
between Jewish people and every person created in the image of God who exists in this world. It's not for us to lead a Hasidah-styled existence. In his introduction, Rav Soloveitchik referred to Moshe Rabbeinu as our prime rabbinic role model. And indeed, we find in Shmot Perik Bet, the second chapter of Exodus, where there is an introduction to Moshe at a time when he was growing up, we find there the qualities that are mentioned through which HaKadosh Baruch Hu recognized, here we have the makings of the world's greatest leader. So let's have a look at that chapter, Shmot Perik Bet. And indeed, very briefly, we will see that Moshe excelled in the gift of empathy. He was one who was totally sincere, and he was also absolutely inclusive. Shmot Perek Bet commences with a pasuk. And a man from the house of Levi went, and he took to wife a woman from the house of Levi, and she conceived, she gave birth to a son. Isn't that amazing? This is the ultimate birth announcement. We know the names of all of them. Amram Yochevet. And at birth, at his Brit Milah, Moshe Rabbeinu was given the name of Tuvia. That, according to Chazal, was his original name. The good one of the Lord. It was Pharaoh's daughter who gave him the name Moshe later on. So we know the names. This is Sefer Shmot, book of names. And here's the ultimate birth announcement. A man married a woman and they had a son. Where are their names? And you know their names are of incredible significance. I heard a beautiful Dvar Torah from Rabbi Shalom Ariskin about the names Amram and Yochevet. Amram was a child who was born at a time of great Jewish persecution. His parents wanted to impart a message to him saying, Amram, you are part of a nation that is elevated. Others might trample on us as if we are vermin, as if we are dirt, as if we are second-class citizens, but you should always know, Amram, you're part of a nation that has dignity, that should hold its head high. What an incredible name. Yochevet, Lord of Honor. At a time when people were asking, where is God? How can he allow this to happen to our people? Her parents said, Yochevet, our creator is a God of honor. He will keep our nation alive. He will keep to the word of his covenant. What incredible names, so why aren't they mentioned? And I would like to suggest as follows. This birth announcement is with this wording to teach us the lesson that anyone can become a Moshe Rabbeinu. Yichas is nice, but you don't have to have great yichas. You don't even have to have a small amount of yichas to become a Moshe Rabbeinu. If you're a human being and you're endowed with a neshama, you can go to such great heights in terms of what you can achieve in this world. Greatness is not reserved for those who come from special families. Greatness is there for any single man or woman to achieve. And that's why Moshe is introduced in this way. And then we're told about how his very presence was a danger to his family. He was placed in a basket of reeds in the waters of the Nile. Pharaoh's daughter saw him, stretched out a hand, brought him towards her. And she opened the basket. And behold, there there was a yeled, a child. Behold, it was a lad who was crying. Look at what he said. He was both a yeled and a nar at one and the same time. A little child and also a lad. So the Rebbe of Sokachov explains as follows. You see, a yeled only cries for himself or herself. That infant cries when he, she, he or she is hungry, thirsty, uncomfortable, in pain. It's only at a later time that the child develops the power of empathy to feel the pain and suffering of others. That's when you become the na'ar. Pharaoh's daughter discovered something remarkable. She opened the basket. Behold, there was a yeled, but when he cried, he wasn't crying for himself. 
It was a cry of empathy for others who were suffering. A child who was in tune with the overall pain of his people. That Tomer, and therefore she exclaimed, Me al day hai friends there. This is a Hebrew baby. It's only the Jewish people who have that power of echpatiot, of caring for others, of empathy from such a tender age. That was the very first emotion of Moshe Rabbeinu that we're introduced to. It's through his empathy that he showed he had the potential to be a great and outstanding leader. And then we're told how he left the palace of Pharaoh to look to his brethren. He goes out and he sees an Egyptian taskmaster persecuting one of his fellow Hebrews. He looks this way and that. And there is Ein Ish, there is no man. He turns to the right, to the left. He sees there is no man. Therefore, he strikes the Egyptian. He hides his body in the sand. And he goes out the next day and he sees two Hebrews who are striving with one another. And he confronts them and they say, what are you going to do to us, what you did to the Egyptian yesterday? So my question is, how did they know what happened on the previous day? On the previous day, he looked this way and that and there was nobody. Now suddenly it's common knowledge. Ah, so you'll say, well, that Hebrew must have told people. But he wouldn't have because he would have been a marked man. So there can only be one answer. In Pirkei Avot we learn, In a place where there is no man, strive to be a man. Moshe Rabbeinu came out into a place where there were many Hebrews. He saw an Egyptian persecuting one of his brethren and he noticed that his fellows had become resigned to this persecution. Nobody was willing to raise his or her hand. It was a makom she'ein ish, a place where there was no man. And he said, I'm not going to allow this to take place. I'm going to lead with conviction. I'm going to set an example for others, even though it might endanger my life. And as a result, he smote the Egyptian. Indeed, he was a man of deep sincerity. And we're immediately transported to another scene. Pharaoh sought to kill Moshe. And he moves to Midian. And there he's standing by a wellside. Jethro's seven daughters were there. First come, first serve should be the rule of the day. But they are swept to the side. The male shepherds come along. Moshe Rabbeinu comes along. He's in a foreign land. People he's never met before. He sees an injustice. And what does he do? He steps in and he says... This is not right. I will not allow this to happen. You cannot denigrate people in this way. He stood up for those ladies and he gave their flocks water to drink. And they come home to their father and he says, why is it that you've come home so early today? And they say, there's a new man in town. Ishmitri, it's Ilanu Adam. It's this Egyptian man, we don't know who he is. And the father says to them, and where is he? Kiren lechem, call him so that he should break some bread with us. This is the natural reaction of a parent of seven unmarried daughters. There's a new man in town, and he says, Where is he? Bring him home. So they call him, and he then marries Tipora, and the rest is all history. So, what do we find here? Moshe grew up as the man who empathized, the leader of conviction, and now we find him being the champion of inclusivity. It wasn't only for his fellow Hebrews that he was willing to raise his head above the parapet. It was for his fellow human beings as well. He had a universalistic attitude to life. For foreigners, for aliens, for those of a country he had never been in before, for women whose rights were not promoted as they should have been, he was willing to stand up for them. That is a true leader. In the Seder of Pesach, the name of Moshe is missing. It's amazing. The Haggadah should be a tribute to this outstanding leader, and yet his name is not there. Although there is one reference to him, Vayaminu, Vadashem of Moshe Avdo, just by the way. But there's no actual tribute to him. And I believe the reason for this is that the true legacy of a great leader is not to have his name in neon lights, but rather to have his influence in the hearts and the minds of people. 
The center of Toldot commences, Ele Toldot Noach. These are the generations of Noah. And you would expect immediately afterwards to have a list of the names of his children and grandchildren. Instead, what does the Torah then say? Noach Itztadik, Hamima Yabodorotav, Eta Elokimitalech Noach. Noach was a righteous man. He was perfect in his generations, he walked with God. Those were his Toldot. Those were his generations. And Rashi explains, Melamed, She'ikal Toldotehem, Shel Tamidei Chachamim, Ma'asehem. The primary Toldot, the primary generations of rabbis, are their good deeds which are internalized by their students and their followers. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're paying tribute to the memory of Rabbi Alan Mervis Zichron Olivracha, a truly outstanding Rav. He embodied and he carried out through the 32 years of his service to his kehila, every single one of the attributes of a great Rav of which we have spoken this morning. He was the ideal fusion of a shepherd and a sheepdog. He was there for those who cared, for those who were committed, and also for those who were on the fringes. fringes. He was there for the chacham, the wise members of his community, the devoted ones, the frum ones. But he was also there for those who were irreligious, and he treated them as equals, echad, 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 Everyone was precious in his eyes. He knew how to medaber, how to be a great orator. His sermons he wrote down, and they can be read today with great clarity. He was also a man who excelled in Amira, to have a chat, to have genuine concern, to take an interest in the lives of others. He was a person who sought to influence rather than to impose Jewish tradition on others. He would be Mesaper, he would dazzle others through the sparkle of Jewish life, and he was there as the Nagid to demonstrate by personal example how it all should be done. He was a person who was charged with much empathy for others. He was absolutely sincere and genuine, and he was fully inclusive. Like Moshe Rabbeinu, he was there for one and all and had believed in the sacred divinity of the soul of every human being. Today we're having this lecture to his memory, but in truth, his legacy is in the hearts and the minds of so many people around the world and through them, so many people in subsequent generations who will continue to be influenced by this outstanding Rav a great role model for us all. And even though he lived and practiced in the previous century, his style and his ways will indeed set an example for all Rabbanim, all Mechanchim in the 21st century. It's been my privilege to present this lecture in his memory. May the memory of this outstanding man be for an everlasting blessing. Amen.